There's so much news happening around the world that we're somehow supposed to stay on top of. That's why we launched The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio that turns down the volume a bit to give you some space to think. I'm Wes Kosova. Each weekday, I dig into one important story and talk about why it matters. Listen to The Big Take on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Welcome to Merrin Talks Money, the after show. This is where we unpack all the commentary, or some of the commentary at least, that you hear in our regular podcast. I'm Meryn Somerset Webb. This week, John Steppick, senior reporter at Bloomberg, author of the Daily Money Distilled newsletter, which you should be reading every day. Do so if you are not. Joins me to discuss my conversation with ARK Investment Management founder, CEO and CIO, Kathy Wood. John, you'll have listened to the whole thing by now, right? Uh, I, I have read the transcript, yes. That's, just, that's like listening to it. It is like listening to it. In fact, it's better than listening to it. Um, it was a, a longer conversation than a lot of the ones that we have on this podcast. And I thought I would let the conversation run because a lot of people are still very heavily invested in, in ARC innovation. A lot of people are incredibly loyal to Kathy. And those people and other people really want to hear what she says. So did you enjoy it? Oh, yeah. I mean, she's a very uh, engaging and entertaining storyteller. Um and I think that's basically the, the secret of her success. I think that that is Cathy's edge. Cathy's edge is being able to sell a good story to investors um, and make money from it. That doesn't necessarily mean that the investments that she's in are going to make money or certainly not necessarily from the prices at which kind of, she's been keen to pay for them. And I think that's are you calling the, her? Are you, are you, stop, 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 stop. Are you calling her an asset gatherer? Um, As opposed I mean, to a stock picker, because that's yeah, quite rude, John. Uh, well, I know, I mean, but I mean, only within fund management circles, but I guess that's the ones that she moves in. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's it's ingenious marketing, um, and I actually think that you know it's it's interesting because obviously, I know something you didn't touch on, but Kathy has um, has kind of discussed her kind of strong. Uh, religious kind of views and there is something evangelical about ARC I mean obviously even the name um, and whenever I was going through the conversation I just thought it was really interesting because it's like they're, they're very convincing arguments but they are also very much arguments that are kind of cherry picked to suit and they're, they're, they're also macro based you know for somebody who's a stock picker they're all about themes and they're all about uh, you know the 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 big picture, and talking about deflation, for example. Um, I did ask her about that. To be fair, I did start with let's let's start with macro. I said because she's known to be quite a good macro analyst, right? So uh, so we started with that. I, I led her into the conversation about uh, about uh, deflation. Nothing like that. And I actually think, and I have been saying for quite some time, that we're going to see deflation before all of this is over. And we're beginning to see it already. Yeah, but isn't it a bit convenient that deflation, you know, because basically all of the stuff that she owns in ARC and the reason that the ARC has done badly over the last couple of years is because interest rates have gone up and it's very much been associated as the, the most, you know, the kind of long duration stocks, the ones that don't make any money yet. But as long as you hold them and believe, then eventually they'll make lots of money. The kind of fairy tale stocks and the sort of things that thrived in the low interest rate world, and it's like, I guess it's like it's a bit like SoftBank. So when you look at SoftBank, the big Japanese kind of investment fund that's owned by Masayoshi Son, um, and he's got these kind of like almost comedy PowerPoint packs where he'll talk about all the private companies that he owns and you know that he's he's kind of fund, and there'll be like he had one for WeWork. That somebody put up the other day and reminded us of, and whenever they bought WeWork, the the idea was that uh, there, there was a kind of a graph, and it showed the line going down, and then bouncing back up to never before seen highs, and it was kind of like the the, the kind of commentary around it was, uh, this is the uh, the 
the, the theoretical turnaround <laughs> for this company. And of course, WeWork just went bust. Um, this is the week we said goodbye to WeWork. Yeah. Maybe for the maybe for the last time. It can, it can be reincarnated. Things like WeWork. So let's not write it off, John. Could be well, back next can't week. Write it off, but, <laughs> but anyone but invested technically, in it. Technically, this is the week we say yeah. goodbye. And everyone certainly say goodbye to their money. That's for sure. But the thing is, this yeah. we've, we've lived in a bull market for storytelling, and that was created by low interest rates. So you could basically tell any story as long as it was a good one. Somebody would give you money, and I think Kathy's still stuck in that world. Because well, I thought the bit that you would like best, based on. John. Yeah, the bit I thought you'd like best in the entire transcript um, or audio for people who are, you know, the time to listen to the audio as opposed to skim the transcript. The best bit was when Kathy told me that her fund was a deep value fund, and I thought <laughs> that'll 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 give John a, a a bit of a spluttering into his coffee. And you know, our but you're not really valuation driven, are you? We are if you give us five years. And if you give us five years, then we are a deep value manager. We're a deep value manager. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. The idea that um, it's like Warren Buffett during his cigar butt days, uh, like proper Ben Graham stuff. And yeah, so it's deep, it's deep value relative to kind of like, I mean, you know, Bitcoin is deep value now. If you believe, as I think Cathy does, that it's going to go to $1.5 million uh, before 2030, I think was her most recent um, forecast for Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, sure, if you buy it at 30 grand, then yes, it's deep value, but but only in the sense that if you believe the most outlandish prediction is going to be correct, um, then it's it's cheap relative to that prediction. Um, yeah, it was an interesting one because she did say that... Um uh, there's a bit here, you know, most people when they when they look at their valuation, they're looking just at this year, maybe next year. And, and then she says, well, we look at five years. Now, I, I, I listened to her saying that and I thought, well, quite right, you should give it five years. And, and I think everybody does. Yeah, I mean, five so years. It's kind of a trope of fund management to say judges over five years, not over one year or two years. Of course, we don't. It's much more fun to judge them over one year or two years. You know, we enjoy that a lot more, don't we? But we should obviously judge everyone over over five years. But I think the thing that, that I found interesting was that she knows, and, and we discussed, that very that rising interest rates are horrible for long-duration assets, but and high interest rates are horrible for long-duration assets, i.e. Uh, assets which the returns come far in the future. Jam tomorrow stocks, as you like to call them, John. Um, but she still feels that the stocks in her portfolio have been treated unfairly. Yeah. I mean, and I suppose that's the other thing. You start from... That kind of um, that you start from that kind of top down approach, and also, like I said, the macro story that she's telling is was one about deflation. So she clearly realizes that falling interest rates would be bullish for her fund. Um, but she says she, she's also got to hedge it by saying, "Yeah, but these stocks will do well anyway." I mean, again, mm, it's, mm. It's, it's and kind she of does have a like period. Yeah, she's had a previous period of of performing well when rates are rising, but obviously. Nothing like this when rates are rising just a little bit in a rather different environment. There's a massive rise in interest rates. The constant rise is a very different environment. Yeah. Um, and also staying high is a different environment as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I just don't think that you can... Well, I suppose it's, it makes sense that she wouldn't change her story now. Because, well, yeah, why, why would you? I mean, that's not... People... People do buy fund managers on the basis of their style. And one of the kind of killer things for any fund manager is style drift. If you turn around and, you know, if everyone's owning you for one reason and then you say, oh, I'm going to change my mind, then that's, that's going to destroy your career. And that's absolutely fair enough. And from that point of view, you know, I've got a lot of respect for her. I mean, in lots of ways, she's just a more kind of aggressive, um, American -y style Scottish mortgage trust. And I was like, um, well, interestingly, one of I when I was at at an event the other day and and talking to people about about Arc and also about Scottish mortgage, and several people said to me that they used either Arc or Scottish mortgage interchangeably uh, to balance out their uh, their rougher and their personal assets. Yeah, I think yeah. that makes just in case, good sense. just in case, you know, these are fascinating stories. And incredibly compelling, and 
uh, you know, uh, so many of these things may well happen, will probably happen. You know, we're on, we're on the edge, we hope, you and I and everybody else, we're on the edge of the kind of technological revolution that will give us the, the uh, productivity revolution that we've been waiting for for decades and decades, haven't we? We've been saying for ages, look at all this new tech, there's going to be a productivity revolution. I mean, a revolution in healthcare, a revolution in this, a revolution in that. And it hasn't quite happened, but it feels like you look at the kind of thing that, things that Kathy says, I know she's been saying them for a few years, but nonetheless, the technology is ready, it's available. We may be on the edge of, of, of the explosion that we've been waiting for, but that won't necessarily translate into the prices of the stocks in portfolios like that going up another 400% in a year. Yeah, and that, that is the difficulty. It's like there's always timing with these kinds of things and there's always the winners and the losers with any kind of tech thing. I mean, one interesting point is that obviously the biggest tech kind of uh, hype this year has been around artificial intelligence and the best stock, in fact, pretty much the only stock to play that as a picks and shovels play was NVIDIA, the big chip manufacturer. And of course, Cathy famously got rid of that. It's one of the few... Um, tech stocks that she kind of disposed of before it then kind of rocketed earlier this year. Um, and well, That is an interesting one. Really no competition. Well, it's not so much as getting no competition. But it's so, yeah, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's the, it's very much the go-to stock for that sector. Um, and it was actually, it was the go-to for the gaming boom and the Bitcoin boom as well, because their chips are the, the key ones for all of those processing activities. Um, and I just thought it was interesting that at the same time as everyone else was you know, jumping on that bandwagon, um, she actually kind of exited it, and unfortunately at the, the wrong time. Um, but it does just show you that even a fund that's focused on this stuff is going to get it wrong sometimes. Sometimes, eh? The thing, uh, one of the <laughs> things that I thought was interesting was the um, discussion we had about Cameco and nuclear and her firm belief that uh, moving into into uranium and uh, by default, obviously, into nuclear energy is the only way forward for the energy transition. And she's very into the idea of uh, modular reactors, etc. I thought that was quite interesting because it's not the subject that I would have associated with her. Uh, and she tells me that, in fact, she's been looking at that since, um, well, for the last decade or so, two decades. About nuclear, because they're looking at facts again. We believe it is the cleanest other than other than hydro. It is the cleanest energy source out there. It is the safest when you look at accidents uh, associated with uh, exploring and developing for for um, energy. And uh, yes, we think that uh, after years, this is, this is, you know, 10, 12 years of being denigrated, that environmentalists and, and others are now looking at the facts when it comes to nuclear. And uh, and deciding, you know what, <laughs> we probably won't. well. I mean, that's interesting. I did I did think that was interesting. I'm quite bullish in nuclear as well. It is a very different area, though. I and mean, when you think about it, the nuclear story is a pretty old one. Actually, it's come back over and over again in cycles. And what has tended to happen is, unfortunately, you've had something, you know, like Fukushima was what what put an end to the last uranium bull market. Um, and hopefully this time it is different and finally we're kind of outgrowing our fear of uh, nuclear partly driven by either needing to find a way to keep the lights on while we decide to dismantle our kind of fossil fuel infrastructure. Well, it feels um, like now now we're beginning to accept that wind and solar are not as cheap and effective as we thought they might be. Uh, nuclear is pretty much our only way out if we want an effective energy transition. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because, as you say, that's not really... That it's it's a bit different, and again, it sort of feels like uh, this is a bull market you've spotted that you think you can get on board rather than. You know, I mean, Cameco is a very old company; it's a very old school company as no well. No innovation there. Well, I yeah, I mean, I'm assuming being a miner, they probably have I probably get slightly more innovation than we yeah, we realise sure sometimes. Yeah. No, you're right about that. That's one of the things that um, Ed Conway kept telling us over and over and over was don't underestimate or we need to recognize how incredibly productive these mines have become. The innovation in mining is massive. There's not as many people down mines as there used to be. Very innovative, very productive. So no, you're right. I take it back. It's an innovative company. No, no. It's, just, <laughs> it's interesting. Though, I mean, but it doesn't if you quite look fit up, the bill. No, and I just pulled a chart of Cameco up 
So Cameco, as you would expect, kind of last peaked in 2011 when, you know, Fukushima happened. Um, it then basically went down pretty much non-stop with a little blip up in 2014 and it kind of came to its absolute bottom in uh, March 2020 whenever obviously the pandemic was causing them a havoc. It's now almost back at that 2011 high. So I'm just wondering at which point in the bull market between the bottom in 2020 and uh, reaching the old kind of 2011 high, Cathy actually bought it, having, you know, been thinking about it for a decade. I can't answer that, but we'll look it up later. <laughs> I'm just wondering, put it that way. <laughs> we'll look it up later. Um, okay, anything else we want to talk about in there? Anything else grab your attention? Um, also, I, I thought it was really interesting, and I love hearing about all these technologies. Yeah. I love hearing about CRISPR. Such fun conversations. Robots, mm. all that sort of stuff. But it is a classic case of uh, story-driven investment. And one of the things that we're always told to try and avoid doing as investors is being seduced by stories mm, as opposed to are. focusing on the numbers. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Bull market for storytelling. And I don't think she should change because, you know, it's not a good way to be. So people buy her for what she yep. is. Um, and the thing I didn't talk about with her, and um, if she ever comes on again, I'd really like to talk to about her, is, is the building of the business, you know, because it is an extraordinary business. It's billions and billions under management, uh, pretty high management fees relative to some other fund manager, managers working in the same area. So, you know, it makes a fortune. It makes an absolute fortune um, based on the, the as on the management and the fees. So she's running the performance of the assets aside. She's running a really fabulous business. Yeah. And I mean, she's a very good entrepreneur. Mm. Great I think entrepreneur. You absolutely have to handle that. Yeah. And I mean, she, she counts as... Um, her company is also an innovative company. She's an innovative disruptor in her own right, which is impressive. Um, and when I asked yep. her the question about uh, gold and Bitcoin, I guess I kind of knew the answer, I'm afraid. Um, so if I'm going to give you a choice of three asset classes, or three assets, should I say, and you have to choose one to hold for 10 years, you're not going to have to think very hard. Uh, the three are gold, a deposit account, cash deposit account, or Bitcoin. Bitcoin, hands down, hands down. Bitcoin is a hedge against both inflation and deflation. So is gold. Uh, yes, so is gold. But um, Bitcoin is digital. And if you look at the incremental demand, we're going to see but gold already has its demand. You know, it's happened, right? Uh, Bitcoin is new. And institutions are barely involved and young people would much prefer to hold Bitcoin than to hold gold. So, um, you know, it's interesting that both gold and, and Bitcoin are, um, hedges against, uh, deflation, but, uh, Bitcoin's been doing better recently. Yeah. Although, but yeah, but what I liked about that is, like, to be fair, she's the one that's come closest to anyone that we've talked to of sort of given the rationale for it yes. in a, yes. you know, in a in a clear way. Now, whether you agree with it or not, um, you know, I, to be honest, I, I, the only reason, the main reason I'd favour gold is because, well, it's been around for ages, and unlike most things, that's actually a benefit in this particular circumstance. But I absolutely, I don't disagree with the argument. I think that is a valid argument. Um, I, I mean, I'm not convinced it's going to go to over a million dollars, but then maybe one day I'll be kicking myself. Keep telling you to buy some. I know, but I'll just lose the password, like you. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, a lot of people keep telling me on Twitter I'm just better. Well, you know what? I am better. It's true. It's true. Um Right. Okay. So another one to add to our Bitcoin list. And the last thing I'm going to say on it is she is the first person who has told us that you should hold Bitcoin because it's a hedge against deflation and inflation. No one's ever said that to us before. And obviously, there is no evidence of that yet. Early days for Bitcoin. But it would be quite interesting if that turned out to be true, which I suspect it won't. But uh, you, know, you never know. <laughs> you never know. John, thank you so much for your criticisms and misery. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thanks for listening to this week's Marin Talks Money, the after show. 
This episode was hosted by me, Marin Subset Webb, alongside John Stefik. It was produced by Summer Sadi and additional editing by Blake Maples. When you get your news from Bloomberg, you don't just get the story. You get the story behind the story. How your EV's battery may not be as green as it seems. Why a decrease in global birth rates could send countries scrambling to increase immigration. You get context. And context changes how you see things, how you change things. Because context changes everything. Go to Bloomberg.com to get context.